Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to present to you about two different pencil manufacturing companies, Dixon Ticonderoga and Farmer Castell. Uh, we're going to talk about their fortunes since the 1990s and their contrasting experiences with globalisation. And therefore, uh, we're going to start with um, globalisation. So, a definition cited by uh, Brinkman and Brinkman in their 2002 article called Corporate Power and the Globalisation Process cited it as the phenom uh, understood as the phenomenon by which market and production in different countries are becoming increasingly interdependent uh, due to the dynamics of trade in goods and services and the flows of capital and technology. As we've seen, globalisation is by far the largest and most significant trend in business environment in the business environment and has had a huge impact on a wide range of businesses. The largest of these impacts can be seen as a result of increased global integration. This is where producers have been brought closer to consumers, however also consumers have been brought closer to rival producers as well. And we've had the diversification of production processes. Father Castell has managed the, the potential threat of globalisation uh, and reaped from its benefits. There's been a growing demand for, uh, there's been a growing demand in developing countries and Father Castell has seized upon this opportunity. Their sales figures from 2011, uh, 2010, 2011 to 2011, 2012 increased by only 1% in North America and Europe, 5% in Latin America, but 18% in, in the Asia and Pacific regions, which is the developing markets. Uh, they received their ecological certified wood from Costa Rica, have plantations in Brazil, and received their graphite for the pencils from Siberia, so they've outsourced their production, lowering their costs of production. Dixon Ticonderoga, in contrast, have struggled. And ultimately, their contrasting fortunes uh, can be explained by their inability to benefit from globalisation. However, it is worth noting that they are a smaller and less well internationally known brand. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Okay, has anybody ever heard of the company Dixon Ticonderoga? No, no one? What about Faber Castell? Yeah, a lot of nods there. Right, well, there's a reason for that. Uh, they, had two ver they had very contrasting experiences in the uproar of globalisation in the 90s, and as Jack had said, we're going to be exploring this. Um, so Dixon Ticonderoga had a very tough start for the 90s. Um, 89-91 they had absolutely no profit and they manufactured only in the US. Uh, and 1992 was yet another poor year with only $327,000 net income. And the next year only saw it decrease by 1%. As it's clear to see, Dixon was clearly struggling and they had little or no profit throughout these years. Between 94 and 99 they continued to struggle, very low profits. Uh, by 2000, they were finally manufactured in many countries. However, this could be argued to be far too late as their revenues fell to just $80 million. And in an attempt to cut costs, they closed all of their US factories in 2002. But in 2004, they were acquired by Fina Fabrica. Here is a graph that shows the revenues and profits of Dixon Ticonderoga between 1990 and 2004 which is an interesting way of looking at their fortunes. Uh, between 1990 and 1993, there wasn't much uh, gain in profit or revenues, um, but in 1991 and 1993, they slashed their overheads and uh, they took economy and reconstructing measures, which did show an increase in revenues. And also in 1993, uh, anti-dumping measures were introduced which helped the revenue grow until 1996. So this arrow here shows when the Chinese were able to undercut uh, Dixon Ticonderoga, even with the anti-dumping tariffs, um, which produced a fall in Dixon Ticonderoga's <coughs> revenues, um, as you can see here, to the point where they stopped manufacturing the US in 2002 and they were eventually acquired by FILA in 2004. And Anna will now explain the story of Faber Castell. Yeah, Faber Castell is a German, fam um, German family business in its eighth generation, which was founded in 1761 and which has grown to become the world's largest pencil manufacturer. 1849 was when they first started globalizing by establishing a sales office in New York, and a couple of years later, they um, spread out all over Europe. As early as the 19th century, Lothar von Faber, who was the grandson of Faber Castell's founder, stated that he wanted to rise to the highest position by making the best that can be made anywhere in the world. This was 
um, company's main principle throughout its history, and it just shows the strong global awareness they had right from the start. Two decades ago, they then started their sustainable forestry project in Brazil, and have up until now planted 10,000 hectares of um, pine forests, which is equal to the size of 14,000 football fields, and they use this wood to produce their fences. After having made the loss in 1992 and 1993, they had to take tough measures and laid off 30% of their workforce. However, they used this very difficult time effectively by completely restructuring their company and, um, and improving their brand image. So by 2007, they had then greatly recovered and had a turnover of 400 million euros, of which 85% were generated outside of Germany. This again shows the strong global awareness they have. Then in the first couple of years, in the 21st century, they more than doubled their sales and by 2010 they produced 14% of the pencils on the global market. So we can clearly see that they have grown to become the world's leading pencil manufacturer. At the moment, 900 of the 7,000 workers are employed in Germany, which means that almost 90% of the workforce is outsourced. From 1990 onwards, there has been an increase in the demand for pencils, particularly in the developing countries. And although global demand has increased enormously, the globalization of manufacturer and markets has meant that Dixon, Ticonderoga and Faber-Castell have faced stiff competition. They needed to gain strong market advantage to overcome this. And Faber-Castell achieved this in a number of ways that will be explained later but an important part was clearly differentiating their products. An example of, of Dixon Ticonderoga is a classic school supply where they used popular image such as Looney Tunes and Scooby-Doo, whereas Faber-Castell made a new type of pencil to help children grip it properly. This is an example of innovation versus image, with image being easy to counteract by a competitor, whereas innovation is much harder to counter. So now we come to the question, why did Dixon fail? Uh, this really is a, a kind of a rolling process. Firstly, they felt that the US market was sufficient for them. And therefore, when the competition did come into the market, which was mainly from China, uh, it meant that their really only product line, which was cheap, low-end, generic pencils, uh, were matched and bettered on price competitiveness, and more often than not, were of better quality. The Chinese imports were of a better quality. So the Chinese imports began to take over the market uh, share and of course, the, uh, when the anti-dumping tariffs failed, this only brought down, this only brought a Dixon's um, rapid reduction in the market. It only brought it further forward. So we can see that there are poor strategic management uh, and bad planning from Dixon. And these causes would most probably have been, if not averted, then certainly lessened in impact if they had been able to globalize. So if they'd been able to move their production uh, overseas to lower their cost of production, or if they'd been able to innovate then they have, would have been able to be in different markets to the Chinese imports, so they wouldn't have suffered so badly when the Chinese imports did enter the market. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about Faber-Castell's management now, which is fundamentally different to Dixon Ticonderoga's. And the first point to make is that they have a very experienced management team, with one of Faber-Castell's family men members always in the position of the CEO, which meant that they have a very personal um, aspiration of improving their company's performance, in addition to the usual business thinking that a CEO has. And as I mentioned earlier, they always maintained their key morals and principles, as, um, such as making products of the highest possible quality or having a very strong commitment towards environmental and social aspects. So they do not only plant their own trees in, for example, Colombia or Brazil, but they also use environment-friendly water-based paint, which is much more expensive to produce but still they produce this lacquer because they think that it's of a higher quality and it doesn't have any um, poison um, things, especially for small children. So they were always opting for high quality. Um, in, in contrast to Dixon Ticonderoga, they were able to distance themselves from the cheap Chinese competition. And in order to protect themselves from the cheap fakes that were produced in the middle of the 19th century, they signed the Trademark Protection Act in 1875. Moreover, they always had their customers' wants and needs in mind, which meant that they produced products which fulfilled these wants even before the customer became aware of them. So they were always in a process of constant product improvement. Two 
few words that spring to mind when thinking about Faber Castell's management are innovation and creativity, as mentioned earlier. And I'm going to look at the product dif differentiation in a bit more detail. They started creating a broad range of, um, of products from very early on. So now they have um, the classic school supply, but also creative art materials and exclusive writing utensils, such as the Perfect Pencil. This is a pencil of very high quality with an integrated sharpener and eraser. And a couple of years ago, they even entered into the niche market of cosmetics, so they created cosmetic pencils. Okay, this video is an example of one of the many innovative uh, product differentiation schemes that Faber Castell carried out. The last point to make about their management is that they decided to follow the garden model, which means that they treat their employees in the best possible way. They have the best working conditions, which results in having highly motivated and committed um, and qualified employees, which not only identify with the company, but with the entire brand. Faber Castell had a good long-term strategic vision that survived Germany going through two world wars. Uh, right from the start, their goal was to be a top global player, and that they approached this by aiming to provide high-quality products. Uh, this is a huge distinction from Dixon Ticonderoga, who played for the mass market and suffered terribly because they were attacked by cheap, low-quality products, uh, so cheap that they could undercut the anti-dumping tariffs. Uh, in terms of distinctiveness, uh, Dixon Ticonderoga's style was very simplistic, just a matter of colour, whereas Faber-Castell had much stronger branding that was deliberately designed to convey quality and sophistication without significantly adding to the cost. Um, it is far harder for the competition to mimic Faber-Castell's product because their image has more depth and substance. Uh, when you look at the two companies' publicity material, the difference in terms of business environment is clear. Faber-Castell's factory is in the grounds of a picturesque and ancestral castle of the Faber-Castell family. It gives the impression of a traditional and sophisticated operation on a human scale, even though it is now a global leader. Whereas Dixon Ticonderoga had a, ut a utilitarian uh, factories in the USA with no sense of humanity at all, merely manufacturing facilities. Uh, the difference between the garden of Faber-Castell and the machine of Dixon Ticonderoga is clear. Uh, the open thinking of Faber-Castell's management is closely connected with the business environment that they built and nurtured, and that the mechanistic response that Dixon Ticonderoga showed when challenged by the Chinese was related to their over-functional and closed view of their business. Yes, uh, added to what Sam has already identified about what can be learned from this case study, uh, it is the strategic vision that was so badly lacking from Dixon's management strategy and so important in Faber's makeup is one key difference between the two firms and explains why one succeeded and the other didn't. Added to this, the family atmosphere and the garden business model that Anna talked about within Faber-Castell helped them to achieve their goals. But crucially, it was the fact that they had diversified, which naturally spread the risk. And their 
product innovation meant that they were engaged in many smaller markets within the general pencil industry. For example, the watercolour pencil or the cosmetic pencil that we talked about. This meant that when the Chinese did flood the global markets with their goods, which were low end and didn't compete necessarily with Farber's goods, Farber were able to adapt, diversify and ultimately survive, whereas Dixon were not able to. Okay, so the main conclusion that we can draw on from this is that Dixon Ticonderoga, Ticonderoga simply globalised far too late and did not make any alterations to their brand image or their product diversification. On the other hand, Faber Castell were excellent. Not, not only did they take effective advantage of globalisation, they effectively rethought their entire brand image and their products, which could have ultimately led to their success. So in short, Faber Castell effectively exploited the advantages of globalisation, whereas Dixon Ticonderoga fell victim to its dangers. Thank you.